As we're coming upon the spring holiday season, we certainly focus many of our messages primarily on subjects of self-examination, looking deep within ourselves, preparation for the coming of these days because they are so significant in their meanings. As you see, I've entitled this particular message, Plan for Deception to Come. You may think, well, what in the world? That seems like uh, something off topic. As we go through this message here, and I'll probably have to abbreviate it just a little bit, but I, I want us to make sure that we are looking deep within ourselves on some factors that we see examples in scripture from. If you have your Bibles, turn over to 1 Kings chapter one, or I'm sorry, chapter 13, I'm sorry. 1 Kings chapter 13. I'm gonna read the story that is listed this entire chapter regarding Jeroboam, the man of God, the old prophet, and the important lesson from this story regarding unconditional obedience and the need for that. Beginning in verse one, we read, by the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel as Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. He cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord. O oh, altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David, and on you he will sacrifice the priests of the high places, and now make offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. It is so interesting that this is a prophecy that the man of God, for which we have no name, is going to reference a future king of Judah, Josiah, and that is going to be fulfilled in 2 Kings 23, verses 17 through 18, when Josiah will enact many different reforms because of what Jeroboam laid out in decay from religion. Continuing on here in 1 Kings 13, that same day, the man of God gave a sign this is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes of it will be poured out. So he's giving a sign of something that's about to occur. When King Jeroboam heard that the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, seize him. You can see it's a, an act of defiance. But the hand that he stretched out towards the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. I'm sure that made an impression upon him and all the people around. The altar was split apart and the ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God by the word of the Lord. The individual writing Kings is telling you exactly. Yes, a man of God spoke the words, but the words came from the Lord and the Lord performed this act. Continuing. Then the king said to the man of God, intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. The king said to the man of God, come home with me and have something to eat and I will give you a gift. But the man of God answering the king, even or answered the king rather, even if you were to give me half of your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water or re and return by the way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way that he had come to Bethel. Now there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel whose sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day. And they also told their father what he had said to the king. And their father asked him, which way did he go? And the sons showed him the which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his son, saddle up my donkey for me. And when they had saddled up the donkey for him, he mounted it and he rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, are you the man of God who came from Judah? 
I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, come home with me and eat. And the man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat or drink water with you in this place. I have been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way that you came. And the old prophet answered, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat and bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. And while they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who had come from Ju Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment that the Lord your God has given you. You came back and you ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore, your body will be buried in the tomb of your fathers. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him. And he went on his way and a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was thrown down on the road with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. Curious. Some people in verse 25 who passed by the body thrown down there with the lion standing beside the body. And they went and reported it in the city where the old prophet lived. When the prophet who had brought him back from his journey, heard it. He said, it is the man of God who defied the word of the Lord. The Lord has given him over to the lion, which has mauled him and killed him, as the word of the Lord had warned him. The prophet said to his son, saddle the donkey for me, and they did. Then he went out and he found the body thrown down on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside it. The lion had either had neither eaten the body nor mauled the donkey. So the prophet picked up the body of the man of God, laid it on the donkey and brought it back to his own city and mourned for him and buried him. And he laid the body in his own tomb and they mourned over him and said, oh, my brother, after burying him, he said to his sons, when I die, bury me in the grave where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones for the message that he declared by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and all the shrines and the high places in the towns of Samaria will certainly come true. Even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, but once more appointed priests for the high places from all sorts of people. Anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for the holy high places. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and to its destruction from the face of the earth. This is one of those chapters and one of those stories that I think is packed with lessons for us. Lessons for us, yes, even today, and lessons for us in the future. Now, there are a couple of things that, from a context perspective, that I think we need to explain at this. And I'll refer to this in 1 Kings 11 verses 31 through um, 38. What you see here is you see that Jeroboam was promised by God because of Solomon's sins. He was promised the 10 tribes of the northern tribes of the house of Israel after the split. And he was even promised that God would be with him if he would follow him. In fact, in verse uh, in chapter 11, um, he makes the comment that he said, I will be with you, which is, you know, very powerful when you consider in verse 38, then I will be. And if I and if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observation, and observing of my statutes and commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you 
and build you an enduring house as I built for David. And I will give all Israel to you. So he had a promise. And this was before this great event that we read in chapter 13. And as a result of the events of chapter 13, we know he did not turn from what he had done. Because even though God had promised him this great power and, and the fact that he would be with him, in chapter 12, verses 28 through 29, Jeroboam builds altars and he puts golden calves, one at Bethel and one at Dan, one at the south, one at the north. One would think that with the historical consequences associated with previous intercessions with golden calves, the Israelites would have said, uh, no, thank you, but apparently not. They fell into their same sins and transgressions. And I don't think it is any accident that the golden calves were referenced again as a part of these altars. You know, you think about the context of what occurred before and led to chapter 13, the events we read, you know, you, you think and you're like, how could he do it? Why would he do it when so much was offered to him? The question I have for you, the question I have for myself is, why do we do some of the things we do when so much has been offered to us? Why do we continue to have aspects of Phariseeism within us? Why do we continue to do in some of the same things over and over and over that displease our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. You know, there are consequences for all of our actions. And I, I find it interesting when we even look in Scripture. There's a, there's a couple of examples. I won't turn to these for the sake of time. Moses, because at Meribah, he, just, he hit the rock, and when God didn't tell him to hit the rock, he told him to speak to the rock, and water would come. And as a result of his disobedience, Moses, the meekest man that had ever lived, the man who carried a heavy burden of leadership with the Israelites out of the slavery that we will be talking about on an ongoing basis in the coming weeks ahead for the spring holy day seasons of a historical perspective he brought them out of that servitude out of sin in that regard to give them the opportunity to go forward but he could not enter the promised land because of his actions we know even when the ark of the covenant had been taken captive by the philistines and david was ecstatic to be able to get the ark of the covenant back and instead of putting it on rings and having the Levites carry it out, they put it on a cart. The cart began to shift. Uzzah, doing something we think is good, trying to keep the, the, cart or the Ark of the Covenant from falling, is struck down immediately by God. And it is because of irreverence that's listed in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7, that he acted the way that he did irreverence notice that word that's listed there are you am i guilty of irreverence our disobedience much less and don't focus necessarily on the, the disobedience that you perceive you see in your neighbor someone in our group or anyone else focus on our individual disobedience to god and understand that we are held accountable as well for all the disobedience. You know, there are scriptures when we think about this that, and that occurred in 1 Kings, and there are scriptures that reference that you and I are not to be unequally yoked. The Apostle Paul makes reference to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. And he makes the point when referencing this that he says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony has Christ with Bial? 
And what, or what rather, has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what argument or agreement does the temple of God have with idols? You are the temple of the living God, just as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from the midst of her and separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. I've heard a lot of different interpretations over the course of time. All the way from this shows you shouldn't be dating outside the church. To people who had been married, previously divorced, come into the truth of God, and then they're told they got to sleep on separate floors in their rooms of their houses until someone in church hierarchy can determine whether they can still be remain married. That happened locally, by the way. You know, you look at these things and you look at the interpretations of what people are putting upon them. What is the Apostle Paul speaking of? The Apostle Paul is speaking of our joining ourselves to unrighteousness, lawlessness, a way of life, doctrinal beliefs and systems. You know, it doesn't mean that we should go find an unbelieving person in any regards to God and Jesus Christ, but it also means, and he would go on to give more instruction regarding marriages of individuals that had already existed and how they are to be handled in this arrangement. But the focus of what he's talking about here that's been misapplied by so many is what our belief systems are and what agreement we are attaching to, and I'll use the term cultural Christianity and bringing it into the temple of God. That's the focus, not all the things that like to be used. Second John verses eight to 11, I'll reference. He references the fact that, you know, we are to be very, very careful and watch ourselves that we do not lose what we have accomplished. In other words, the things that we have done that are right, hang on to them, continue in them, and don't drift away from them by bringing in cultural Christianity to the temple of God, because you will lose what you have accomplished, and you won't get your full reward. That is very, very enlightening and should, should provide a path for you and I in our teachings, because he goes on in verse 10 of that verse or chapter, there's only one chapter. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him in your house and do not give him a greeting. When we go back to the story of Jeroboam, the man of God and the false prophet, and we think of what Jeroboam did, he never turned away from his idolatry. He brought in ideas of the culture around him into the temple of God and the worship of God when God had told him that he would be with him if he would follow his ways, commandments, statutes, and walk in them like David did. And he turned away. Again, 1 Kings 13, there's a lot for you and I, as, as they say, to chew on if we'll spend time thinking about what we're reading, not just a Bible story, which it is, with a moral, with a lesson, but how we internalize it, how it becomes a part of us. There's some other things for us to think about too, because one of the key elements of what we saw in that story in 1 Kings 13, the man of God was doing exactly what God had told him to do. God acknowledged he was the one that sent him because God split that altar. God caused the hand of Jeroboam to shrivel back. And then apparently God also fixed his hand. Kind of brings shades of Moses and the leprosy and the things of that into your mind as well. But the part that the man of God, for which we don't have a name, and I would submit to you and to myself, I think there's a reason why the name's not given. Could it be possibly that you could insert your own name in there? 
that you and I need to be careful about deception in the world around us. Deception even in the church. Deception of ourselves, our self-deception as we examine ourselves. How do we avoid that? Because that deception of that old prophet is what led to the man of God's demise. He lost what he had gained and accomplished because of his adherence to deception by someone else. He didn't follow God's instruction to not eat and drink and don't come back by the uh, go out the same way you came in. That was God's instruction and he didn't do it. You know, you think back, there's an example and I have just some scriptures um, of, of, of the fact that, you know, a person can still be held accountable even when they are deceived. They're still accountable for their sins. You look at, and I have here some scriptures. I've got Numbers uh, verses, or chapter 15, verses 27 through 28. It says, also, if one person sins unintentional, then he shall offer a one-year-old female goat for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement before the Lord for the person who goes away or astray when he sins unintentional, making an atonement for him that he may be forgiven. Think about that unintentional. Sometimes we can be deceived unintentionally. Are we still accountable? I think so, based on what we see in scripture. When we look at Leviticus chapter 4, we see in Leviticus chapter 4, again, several things are listed in this regard, in this chapter regarding sin offerings and there's references to the people who sin unintentional in verse 1. There's references to the priest who sins as a result of, and, the, and the, the guilt that comes on the people as a result of the, the priest. We see in verse 13, the whole congregation can commit errors, and they, as a result, it can be unintentional, but they're still accountable for what happens. In fact, in verse 27 and 28, it says, Now if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing anything which the Lord has commanded not to be done and becomes guilty. So we're guilty, whether our intentions are whatever they may be. If we sin, we are guilty. And if his sin, in verse 28, which he has committed is made known to him, then he shall bring an offering of a goat and a female without defect for his sin, which he has committed. So even our unintentional sins, we are responsible for. Something to think about. Something for us to consider about ourselves. Leviticus 5.17, if a person sins and does anything which the Lord has commanded not to be done, though he was unaware, he's still guilty and shall bear his punishment. That is a heavy burden for you and I. You know what, what we hear today? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. We may have good intentions and be sinning even now. We have to always be looking deep within ourselves. The man of God in first thir or verse Kings 13 didn't appear to be doing this intentionally. He didn't intentionally do what God said and then intentionally Go against what God said. He was deceived. But he was still held accountable for the sin. You know, we think back to examples in Scripture of accountability as well. You go back, uh, think about Joshua. Think about that when they went into the Israel, or they went into Canaan, I should say, Israel did. And they were told, don't make any treaties with anyone in the land. He said, you can make them with outside people, but not because of people in the land because of the sins of their, that they've committed. And what happened? The Gibeonites tricked Joshua, did they not? They tricked him. They had old, old clothes and moldy bread, and they acted like they'd come from a far, far journey. And what did they want? They wanted a covenant of peace. And Joshua agreed to it. And when we look in Joshua 9, 14, God was upset with Joshua because... And I have here the sentence, he did not ask the counsel of the Lord. 
How many times do you, how many times do I look at myself and do we do things without asking God in prayer? We just say, well, that looks good. We're just going to do that. You know, it, it really it comes to a point where we got to self-examine everything that goes on in our lives. Everything. A total review of ourselves is importantly needed for us. And I hope that as we get into the part when we are coming to the spring holiday season and we're focusing on self-examination, this will be very, very important to you and I. I would like to turn over to Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 through 27. Very familiar scriptures, but understand that Christ gave us a warning and the warning is there's going to be some false prophets, just like in the story of 1 Kings 13, beginning in verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So they say to you, behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Behold, he's, he's in the inner room, do not believe them. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, we read that. We think about the fact that in the future, it won't be just words like the old prophet used in 1 Kings 13 to deceive the man of God. He didn't have any great signs. He just gave a word. He just said, an angel appeared to me and said, you are to come back to me in my house and eat and drink. And the man of God believed him because it was a, an old prophet. Who do we believe? A man or God? Something to think about, whether it's someone standing here or in any other, whether you're listening to tapes, whether you're reading books, whatever. Who do you listen to? We all better be on the right page here. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 9 through 10 references that there will come someone that has an accord with Satan and he'll have great power and signs and show false wonders. Reference to that is, I think, and this is an opinion, I want to state it as an opinion, I think 2 Thessalonians 2 is referencing not a pope in Rome, but someone in the churches of God. And you think about the implications of that. You think about the implications of what we read in 1 Kings 13. Who do we follow? We're very familiar with 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, that all these things that happened, the Apostle Paul references to the church at Corinth, and for our admonition, they are examples and they're written for our instruction. I think it's important for you and I to consider 1 Kings 13 and what happens in light of self-deception as well as future deception that can come on the scene. You know, we, we look at the book of Revelation, and I am going to put here on the screen uh, a, an overview. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 18. It references this beast power that comes on the scene. And, you know, we have a lot of speculation. I've heard a lot of speculation even among us in this church of things that sometimes I think people wade into some waters and their opinions are a little more highly valued than what speculation su suggests. The thing that I think is important here, and I'm this is my opinion, so I try to be always transparent with this. The beast has the power given to it and him by the dragon, just like Second Thessalonians 2 references, this man of sin. And it's interesting that the man of sin is not named either. You have a man of God and a man of sin. And you and I can at times, oftentimes, if we're not careful on our individual level, have our own names in there, depending on whether we're being obedient or disobedient. When the beast comes on the scene in Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11, we see that 
he will come and he will be able to put a sign or an image and if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark then they're going to face the wrath of god it's a false prophet just like there's a false prophet in first kings 13 that lies and it goes after the man of god there is a man of sin my opinion in the that come up in the church that goes after the people of god deception will be used there'll be deception with signs and wonders it won't be just words like first kings 13 of that old prophet but signs and wonders and here's the thing that i think is important too when we think about revelation and we think about the beast many people get wrapped around the axle about hands and foreheads and and computer chips being inserted and all kinds of things like that what is the thing that is the delineating factor for it brings the wrath of god is worshiping the beast bringing yourself under subjection to the beast that has satan's power that's what brings the wrath of god chapter 19 verse 20 the beast will be captured as well as the false prophet and those who worship the beast notice are the ones who are cast alive into the lake of fire just like the man of sin died because of his disobedience if we give in to this false narrative of a false prophet in the future then we can die as well it is very i think connected to one another an old testament story showing a light i find it interesting that the man of god in the story came from judah you might kind of wonder why is that well it seems like if judah was the place for which the temple was at it'd be an emissary for what god would be showing this is a, a you know, the person coming from judah it's coming from the temple of god and with all the things that have been offered to jeroboam he still refused. He went with false ideology. And as a result of his ideology, it resulted in everything being taken from him as well. I think it's important for us to look deep within ourselves. Don't worry about anyone else. Anyone else, wherever they may be. The veil of deception should be a focal point for you and I should have that as a focal point for me. Not to save our hides, but to please our God. To please our Heavenly Father so that we don't fall prey. You know, when you think about it, how can we possibly avoid deception? I have a couple of things right here for us to think about in the rest of the Sabbath day, this afternoon. I hope when you leave here, you go home, you spend some time, you think about this. We need to decide and make a resolution to know God's word. You know, when you think about deception, the words of God, if you don't know them and you're just believing what someone tells you, then you don't check it back to the scripture. You can be misled. Deceit, deceit can occur and deception can occur. But we look at that example in 1 Kings 13. Even when you know the direction that God's telling you to do, you can still fall prey to deception. Even when your eyes can see the scripture and you're given understanding, we still have to do it. 2 John 8, referencing that idea of keeping yourself so that you will not lose what you have already accomplished. We can lose it through deception. It's important that we seek God's counsel, even as we know God's word. And I dare say that there's not a one of us that can honestly say we got it all down pat with God's word. That's the precarious ground you and I stand on. And yet we want to sit down and, or, and try to tell someone else their sin when we're on some very shaky ground ourselves. As we begin to prepare more and more and more for self-evaluation, this idea of deception, preparing for it in advance, making sure that we're not deceiving ourselves has got to be the first step before we worry about even other deceptions. Self-examination and asking God to help us. 
seeing ourselves in the right light so that we're not deceiving ourselves about who we are and what we are is paramount. And I'll just finalize or have one scripture here that I'll put on the screen. That's Psalms 51, verses 16 through 17. I would highly recommend us all meditating, not just reading, meditating on Psalms 51 as well as Isaiah 66. Psalms 51, verse 16 through 17 says, For if you do not delight in sacrifices, otherwise I would give it to it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. If we have the broken, contrite heart, if we are offering up ourselves as living sacrifices to God, our will is being sacrificed for his will in this life. And we are truly being attentive to his word and having it inform our every decision. We are closely studying his word. We are spending time in scripture. And not only that, we're constantly asking for God's counsel. Then I would say we can avoid many of the deceptions to come.